Boom. All right, we have Claire Ardern, and Sam is here as well. Claire, did I pronounce your last name right? Okay. Thank you, you so much. That's very Claire, well would done. would you mind giving us a little intro on yourself, a little background in your current roles and position? Sure. At the moment, I'm a, a research associate or senior researcher at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver in Canada. Uh, I've been in Vancouver. I've been fortunate to live and work and play, as they say, on the West Coast in Vancouver since no, uh, September 2021. And my, my kind of journey to living in Vancouver has been interesting. I've lived and worked in four different countries on four different continents in Australia, the Middle East, Europe, and then now North America. And in that time, over a decade of research training and then and research career, it's been really focused on return to sport, particularly after ACL injury with athletes of all ages and abilities. So when I use the word athlete, I tend to mean anyone from, you know, recreational people who love to play sport for fun on the weekend right through to professional athletes. And my sort of second job, my my other day job is as editor-in-chief of JOSPT. And it's been my privilege to, to, to serve in that role since 2018, middle of 2018. How does one even become the editor-in-chief? What did that process look like? Well, editing is really interesting because as an academic people are interacting, you're interacting with journals all of the time. And I think as clinicians, we are too, because we're reading articles, we're trying to keep up with all of the evidence that's coming out. And it, I think it's interesting because it can seem a bit like a black box. And people ask me this question a lot, a lot actually. How does one become an editor? How does one get on an editorial board? How does one learn how to do these things? And I was really fortunate to work with a fantastic mentor and friend, Professor Karam Khan, whom some of your listeners may know from his BJSM editing days. And Karim really took me under his wing and taught me the ropes at BJSM, where I began in 2015 as an associate editor. So the person who's kind of coordinating the peer review process, soliciting reviews from, from people, making sense of those reviews, working with editors to help figure out, is this a priority for the journal? Is the science good? You know, where are the, where are the limitations? Have the researchers addressed the, the question that they set out to do? All of those sorts of things. So that was where I learned the ropes. And then in 2018, I took the leap. I had some nudges from a few trusted colleagues and, and mentors who said, yeah, you, you really should apply for that editor-in-chief role. And I did. And as they say, the rest is history. And you also have the GOSPT Insights podcast. Was that your decision uh, or who thought of that idea? It was my brainchild, I guess. But I, I don't want to take the credit for, for the podcast. I want to give some, I want to take the opportunity to give a shout out and huge credit and thanks to Chelsea Kuman and Dan Chapman, who are my co-conspirators, if you like, my co-hosts on the JOSPT Insights podcast. And Dan in particular came to me very early on in my editorship. And this is just one of these kind of, you pinch yourself and think, how was I, how, what, what did I do in a previous life to get this good karma to have someone of Dan's caliber? come just out of the blue and say, hey, look, I'm really interested in, in podcasting. Would you give me a chance? And we, or I jumped on that opportunity for sure. And Dan took it and has just run with it and done an amazing job, recruited Chelsea. And I, I think, folks, if you do listen to the JOSPT Insights podcasts, that the, the rapport that Dan and Chelsea have with each other and then that they build with, with the guests that they interview is, is so infectious. I love listening to them on, on the JOSPT Insights podcast. So it's very much a team effort. We, we really love what we do. We love bringing interesting interviews and interesting insights to people every week through the podcast. It's such a privilege to have that opportunity to connect with different guests and learn from different people every week. It's, it's you know, having having all of these people on speed dial, if you like, where you can drop someone an email and say, hey, look, can we chat about ankle sprains? Can we chat about ankle instability? Can we chat about head injuries in, and how how or what's happening in rehabilitation. It's such a privilege to have that opportunity. So um, very much it's it's a testament to the, the calibre of Dan and Chelsea's input into the podcast and also the calibre of the guests that agree to join us for an interview. Awesome. So 
primarily we're going to chat about the 2016 consensus statement that you were the lead author on. I'll just read the whole title. 2016 consensus statement on return to sport from the first world Congress in sports physical therapy burn. Can you give a little intro on how did this even start this consistent consensus statement process? Why was it in Switzerland? What is kind of an big picture goal for this meeting? And then we can dive into these different sections. Sure. And Chris, I should clarify for listeners that when you say burn, you mean burn Switzerland, the city, not burn, as in we're burning people with <laughs> with the title. Although I would accept that's like burn, we're, get, we're kind of making the mark on return to sport. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a few questions there. Let me let me start to unpack some of that. Where this all started, why it was in Bern actually is maybe a good place to start. The Sport Physio Swiss, which is the national sports physiotherapy organisation in Switzerland, and many of you will know and have interacted with Dr. Mario Bizzini, who is longtime supporter of sports PT and, and sports medicine and a, a giant really of, of our profession. Mario has had a long association with Sport Physio Swiss and also with IFSPT, the International Federation for Sports Physical Therapy. And those two organizations joined forces in 2015, actually was the meeting, and then the paper was published in 2016. Bern is the location of the sport Physio Swiss conference every year. I highly recommend the conference. It's incredibly high quality, very practical, in, so relevant to the work that we're doing as sports medicine, sports rehab clinicians and practitioners. So the meeting started there. We gathered a group of 20, uh, I think in the paper, um, or contributing to the paper, there are about 17 authors on that paper, but then we had some other people sort of feed in at various times along the way. So roughly 20 different people contributing to this work. And it grew from the conference content. The conference was one of the early places, I think, that dedicated a, an important, a big space to have these conversations about return to sport that we hadn't necessarily had a whole conference dedicated to return to sport issues in, in the past, it had been, you would discuss return to sport in various places, but not a conference dedicated to return to sport. So I want to give Mario and IFSPT and Sport Physio Swiss credit for for their forward thinking and, and creating the place to have those conversations. And out of those conversations at the conference emerged this consensus statement from this group of people who who did extra work on top of presenting at the conference to, to come together and discuss ideas, to shape the the layout and and the beginnings of the what turned into the consensus paper that BJSM published in 2016 and then ultimately in the couple of months following the conference we all worked as one does <laughs> remotely on putting the the document together writing the paper revising it getting feedback and input from from various different people checking with people who are not necessarily named as authors, but who were very instrumental in providing feedback. I'm thinking of someone like Professor Kay Crosley, for example, who again, massive standing in the community, incredible as a researcher, incredible experience as a clinician. So we, we solicited feedback from people like, like Professor Crosley in that whole writing process to make sure that this was a document that stood up that wasn't simply the opinions of the 20 people or so who were in the room, but, but also had relevance and was important for people across the sports medicine, sports rehab community. Awesome. So it's essentially broken up into four sections and let's kind of go section by section. The easiest place to start is creating definitions and defining terms for return to participation, return to sport and return to performance. So how about we start there and then we'll see where it goes. Sounds good. <laughs> so, do you want me to start? Let's do it. Yeah. So <laughs> can, <laughs> would you mind differentiating <laughs> okay. between return to sport, return to participation, return to performance, these kind of three things you all outlined in the paper? Yes, of course. The It's really thinking about, it's a different way of thinking about return to sport is what, where we were trying to get people. And I don't want to 
it's I don't want to take the credit that this group were the first people to ever think of of return to sport as a continuum or ever to think of return to sport in a different way. I think all we were doing was really capturing the mood and capturing the fact that clinicians, practitioners have been thinking and working with return to sport in this kind of continuum way for many years. It just takes a while for research and published literature to catch up. So the idea of return to sport as a continuum means that you don't have a, a time when you're doing rehab and then a time when you're back to sport. This whole thing is is a continuum, as I say. So return to sport, return, uh, return to participation, return to sport, return to performance is simply reflecting those transitions that athletes, active people naturally make as they move through a period of rehabilitation and a period of recovery after a sports injury. Return to participation was important for us because it, it's getting away from this mindset of I'm an athlete when I'm healthy and I'm playing sport and by definition, if I'm not playing sport, I'm not healthy and I'm not an athlete. It was really thinking about in an injury scenario, there's always something that an athlete can participate in, whether it's rehabilitation, it might be hydrotherapy, it might be, you know, running on the Alter G treadmill, it might be going back to restricted training and, and a practice scenario for sport, but there's always something, but it's not unrestricted sports participation, which is really that next phase of return to sport. So we're moving from more restriction or most restriction at one, one end and least restriction and most emphasis on performance at the other end of this continuum. And the third part of it, that element of return to performance is really trying to pick up the sense that there is a difference for most athletes between getting back on the field or the court or the arena of play or wherever they do their sport, whatever that sport is, and performing to their goal in that sport. And for some people, performance is not an issue and it's not something that they're really concerned about. So the, the idea of the continuum also liberates people, I think, to, to set goals that are relevant to the way that they participate in sport or activity. And also acknowledges that for many athletes, many athletes, as listeners will know, performance is the critical part of this. So it's it's about sort of recognising that returning to performance is not the same for many athletes as simply getting back to their unrestricted sport after an injury. And it helps us as clinicians, practitioners and athletes have those conversations about what are the goals and how do we work together to achieve them. Off of that, can you touch on some of the potential differences among stakeholders uh, about their views of what success means during this process and how that may make yes. things a little messy or just have different expectations throughout the process. For sure. And success is such a slippery concept. It's really hard to define because if you speak to many, if you speak to enough people, you get so many different definitions of what different people in this in this return to sport audience and this return to sport scenario value and what they think what they would define as success so we gave a few examples in the paper and i i share examples when i'm asked to speak at conferences and speak with clinicians and practitioners about the return to sport consensus and it's if you think about it usually for athletes it's about returning to performance. So can I get back to the performance level that I want to? Can I perform well in my sport? Can I do all of the things that I expect of myself as an athlete? That's often how athletes will think about defining success. For a coach, often success is about, well, can we, if, if it's a team environment, can the team reach the goals that the team wants? So whether that's winning the game on the weekend, whether that's winning the championship, the, the grand final, whatever it is. So success is very much about sort of achieving um, performance goal, but in a different sense than I think an athlete would think about his or her um, uh, individual performance. The coach is thinking about performance often in the team environment. And then as clinicians, as practitioners, often we're thinking about, well, how do we, how do we ensure that the athlete stays healthy? <laughs> Whether that's staying healthy in the short term, avoiding re-injury, let's say my, my background is in ACL injury, so I'm very much focused on trying to help athletes keep their knees healthy, not get a, a re injured ACL, not get a meniscus tear, not get another knee, knee injury, but also longer term. And this is a lot where there's a tension, I think, between sport and performing and health. And at the very top level, those things don't often don't 
work well together. So, so that's where I think these very different people in this return to sport scenario will have very different definitions and that's okay. And I think we can all work together to acknowledge that we're looking at this from a different perspective, but where the challenge comes in is to figure out what does everyone value and how do we make sure that we all get on the same page and we've made we've made it we've had the conversations about what do we as a group as a team as a healthcare team as a performance team as a you know support team around the athlete what are we actually considering as success and that's going to look different for different athletes as well for some junior athletes it might be very much focusing on making sure that this athlete has the best chance to have a long-term career in her sport. It might, for a, for an athlete who's trying to get a just that one last contract, it, it might look very different and we might accept a different level of risk and a different, we might define success in a different way depending on the athlete, the athlete's values and, and the stage of career, for example. And right at the end before section two, you, you all discussed the shared decision-making and you were just pretty much hitting on it there, but... I'm sure it becomes hard when the views and timelines are different uh, across stakeholders. And if the patient or the athlete uh, has strong thoughts about returning at this time or about doing X, Y, or Z, how does that, how do you, how does everyone meet in the middle when there may be these kind of divergent thoughts and, and beliefs? It's really challenging, I think. So I don't, I really don't want to pretend that shared decision making is easy. There is a lot of evidence to support shared decision making that comes from, particularly from general practice, from medicine broadly. Uh, there's, there's quite a lot of study in shared decision making as an approach and quite a lot of evidence to support it as an effective approach. What we are advocating for is to bring that shared decision making approach into much more prominence in what we do as a sports medicine community. And I think I see a lot of people doing this already. So please don't take away from this listeners or, or people watching that I'm, I'm suggesting that no one does it. I think actually most of us do do this in practice. It's about trying to fit some structure around it and think about, I think, nudging us to think about return to sport. All of this is about nudging us to think about return to sport in a different way than what we used to think about, which was that the clinician or the medical doctor, whoever, was the gatekeeper and the decision maker for return to sport. And in most scenarios, not all, but most scenarios, what we're trying to do is advocate for the athlete, positioning the athlete as the primary decision maker, not to just let the athlete go away and sort of make up her mind based on, you know, nothing, because that's not support. That's not supporting the athlete. It's about thinking about our roles as practitioners, as clinicians, and how do we best support athletes who are working through their return to sport goals to make an informed decision that's going to be best for the athlete and to support the athlete to take the responsibility to make that decision. Now, it's not going to work in all scenarios. Clearly, in a concussion scenario, for example, the athlete is not in a in a in the right state really to to make that decision an informed decision the athletes had a head injury so there is there are different scenarios where it's not appropriate for an athlete to make an, an informed decision or where the athlete does not have the capacity to make an informed decision another example is when you're working with with pediatric and youth athletes when you're working with athletes who are on, under 18 and i know that you know 18 feels a bit like an arbitrary decision point, but you get my point that there, there are, there are scenarios for different athletes where it's going to be appropriate to support the athlete to take the responsibility for making the return to sport decision. And there are going to be other scenarios where it's different. But on the whole, it's very much about this idea of we talk a lot about athlete focused, athlete centered care. It's really about vivifying that athlete centered care approach, supporting the athlete, providing the athlete with the information that she needs to make an informed decision, answering all of her questions, bringing the information in an, an 
as unbiased way as we can. And I know that's, that's hard and it also takes time. And that's the other point that I want to make about shared decision making is that it's not something that you can just decide, Oh, today I'm going to do it and it's going to work and it's all fine. I'm going to have these shared decision making conversations with every athlete that I work with. This is an ongoing process, particularly if we take the example of ACL injury where the athlete is not expecting to get back onto the field of play for months. So the preferences, the values, the beliefs, the understanding of what's going on in that injury scenario and recovery scenario scenario will change over time. And having the space to be able to work with the athlete to navigate that environment, to answer the questions that come up, how long is my recovery going to take? I've, I feel like I've had a setback. Is this the end? You know, my knees really flared up again. What, what does that mean? Now I'm really scared. So having the space to be able to answer those questions, even a question like, should I have an ACL reconstruction or not? Um, that's, that's another example of where a shared decision making approach can work. But again, it takes a lot of time because athletes might bring questions to you that you don't immediately have the answer to and you need to, you need to feel comfortable to say, I don't, I don't know the answer to that today. I need to go and read. I need to consult with my colleagues. Let me get back to you on that. And let's, let's bring some more information to this table. So it's about figuring out your, um, your knowledge and then where your knowledge gaps are. And we all have those. It's, you know, this is not, this is not about saying that you're a terrible clinician because you don't know the answer to every single question. No one knows the answer to every single question. And that's the point, right? Because people are going to bring different experiences. Athletes will bring different experiences and values and preferences to the table for you as an, as a clinician or a practitioner to consider. And also the other bit that adds complexity here is that usually as clinicians, practitioners, we're working in a team and we will often have different opinions and values and preferences within a team. So if the athlete is getting all of these different opinions from all of these different clinicians and practitioners that she's interacting with, that's incredibly confusing and it makes it even more difficult to have, uh, to make an informed decision. So as a, as a, as a team, as a performance and a medical and health team, We've got to have those conversations among our own group, figure out what is our united front, what are we what can we all agree to? What are we trying to do here? What's the information that needs to go to the athlete? Who's importantly, who's going to communicate that? Who's the central contact person? So all of these things take a lot of time to figure out. And I think the enemy of shared decision making is when you don't have time. So you really have to create the time to have and the space to have these conversations and to feel comfortable to say, look, I, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that, but let me go away and find out some more information. Let's work together to, to get this decision to a good place. Can I give uh, an example that I was actually trying to manage this morning? Very uh, uh, timely topic. So I have a, a youth athlete. He's a junior in high school and he, where I'm in a multidisciplinary sports medicine clinic and we're partnered with the local high school. So our athletic trainers in our department and our orthopedic surgeon, they're in charge of the, uh, the youth sports at this high school. And I have an individual that He's about six months ACL. His understanding from our orthopedic team is nine months and he should be good to go on average. Then he, from my kind of perspective, it's more of this objective criterion uh, on top of uh, this kind of average timeline. And then he has these expectations from the coaching staff of being ready to start his senior year. And then there's all these dynamics and he, he just lost, um, approval for like in-network visits. So now there's the added layer. He's at the six month mark. He's relatively behind where he should be in a lot of aspects. So this assumption nine months is now, I think completely out of the picture and now trying to manage out of network visits and doing remote conversations and remote, um, email back and forth and communication with the head coach kind of discussing what practice and participation look like there, not being able to see him until every four to six months for this kind of cash based testing. And it's just all these like added layers that makes it so tricky to know who's in charge of this process and what is right or wrong. And it is a very tough position that I feel like I'm in. And I had a really hard conversation with him earlier this week that I said, Hey, I, I know I, I comes across as like, I'm the bad guy in this situation. Cause I keep wanting to be a little bit more conservative in this process, but I also want to set you 
up for the most success your senior year of football. And if we don't really establish X, Y, Z, then I don't know if we're doing that and trying to get that across to a minor whose parents are also, there's a very interesting situation there. It's just, it is a, yeah, it's tough to know what is right or wrong and trying to communicate across all stakeholders has been a very good challenge, but a hard challenge. Yeah, it's, I'm really glad that you bring that example, Chris, because it's, it's a perfect example of the challenge for shared decision making because it's, it's not simply you as the clinician or practitioner and the athlete. Sometimes it is, but it's often coaches, parents, if you're working with junior athletes, there might, you know, there's other teammates sometimes, there's other clinicians, there's a whole bunch of people. And I think the, for me, what I hear time and time again from athletes is that, that they value when clinicians take the time to listen, to consider the questions and to answer those questions honestly. And athletes are not stupid. And everybody who's who works with athletes knows this, that athletes pick up when, when you're uncertain or when they feel like you, you're really not leveling with them. So I think that's also really important to feel like I'm not a bad clinician if I am, you know, taking this time or if I, if I'm saying, look, I need to go away and have a conversation with someone. I need to figure out what's going on here. Or as you say, have that conversation of look at, I know that it seems like I'm the bad guy, but what I'm, why I'm doing, why I'm suggesting we, we take this track is X, Y, and Z reason. I think that's also really important. And also when I talk with clinicians about this, I think often people feel like decision-making is about sort of saying, making sure that the athlete does what we would do if it was ourselves, but that doesn't always happen, right? Often athletes will listen to us and they'll often say, well, what would you do if it was your knee or if it was your shoulder, what would you do? And you think, oh, don't ask me that question, please. It's your knee or it's your shoulder. So I think accepting sometimes that the things that we're recommending, the advice that we're recommending isn't always the track that the athlete chooses to go down for lots of different reasons. And that does not mean that you have done a bad job as a clinician or a practitioner. There's a whole very interesting and difficult dynamic, as you explain there, going on here. And, it, and it's challenging for all of us as a health and performance team. Diving into section two, the models to help understand and guide the return to sport process. You all discuss and outline the START framework. Would you be able to talk about what is the start framework? And then maybe we can go through these three steps within the framework. The start framework is, a, I think for me, a really helpful way of organizing the way that I think about risk and supporting return to sport decisions. This, I want to give a credit to Dr. Ian Tria, who has done a lot of work in these frameworks and it's not a decision aid, it's more a framework actually of organizing information, organizing your thought process as a clinician and kind of funneling all of that information into a decision, thinking about all of the different factors that can influence a decision. And as you say, Chris, there are three different stages or three different steps in the START framework. And I should say START stands for the Strategic Assessment of Risk and Risk Tolerance. So it's very much focused on risk, assessing risk, because ultimately return to sport is about managing risk, right? We all, we all get this. We can't, we're not, we're not fortune tellers. We don't have a crystal ball. We can't tell you for certain what's going to happen in the future. We would love to, impossible. We all get that. And return to sport is no different. So return to sport is very much about managing the risk and thinking through what are all of the sources of risk? Where are the places where things could go wrong? How do we balance those risks? How do we balance the scenario? We talked before about the difference between the, the junior athlete who's got her whole career ahead of her versus the athlete at the very end of his career who's, who's just trying to get that one last year on the contract. So that all of those sorts of Scenario, the context around the, the, the sport, the athlete's context is, is also going to play into the decision making. And the START framework acknowledges that and helps, helps us as clinicians have a framework of how to, how to put all of that information together. So the three steps are assessing, I like to think about it as assessing the tissue, assessing the, the sport, and then assessing me. <laughs> so the first one is about the tissue itself. So what is the injury? Is the, is the tissue healed? Has the body 
got sufficient capacity to cope with the demands of the sport, basically? Have we got sufficient tissue integrity to deal with whatever it is that the athlete needs to do? That's the first step. The second step is looking at the the sport itself or the demands of the sport is how I think about it. And are there different things like if I'm if I'm a if I'm a forward in in football in soccer for example, and I need to do, do a lot of sprinting, is there a way that I can either play in a slightly different position? Can I limit the minutes on the field so that the repeated sprinting load is less? And is that going to get me through with my hamstring that's still not quite at a hundred percent? Or do I need to make sure that I have that? that hamstring recovered 110% before I do any of my sprinting. So I was thinking about the the sport itself and the demands of the sport and how that plays into the demands on the tissue. And then the third step is the context, as we talked about before. So is it is it about getting back for a championship match? Is this the Olympic Games final of the 100 metres versus is it the weekend club match that really has no bearing on the season? Or is this a, a junior athlete who has a promising career ahead of her versus an athlete who's got a couple of games left in, in his career, for example? So so you can see it's about looking at the the, the injury, thinking about what, what is the injury and, and the body's capacity to, to recover, what's the sport demands, and then what's the context of the, of the return to sport. And how do you suggest clinicians utilize this process? Is it immediately once they have a an athlete or a patient, they actually write through this process or think it through? Or how does this framework uh, be utilized in a clinical setting? I think different people are going to find different ways that suit their environment. And definitely as a more junior clinician, I found it really helpful to work through. I had to sort of work through because my clinical reasoning skills weren't as well developed. I didn't have as much experience to draw on. I really had to work through all of these things very in a very structured way, very methodically. Whereas I think as, as everyone it gets more experience. You get you get to see these patterns. You recognise these patterns. You perhaps don't have to work through it as consciously or as methodically or as systematically, but you're doing it inherently in your day to day clinical practice. So I think people are going to find different ways to integrate this into their own practice that works for them. But what I really like is that it gives me those three sort of buckets of things to think about, and helps me feel like okay, I'm not totally overwhelmed with all of this information and trying to figure out where do all of the pieces in this puzzle fit together it gives me a structure to think about the the tissue the sport and then the context and then organize all of the information that I've got from the athlete who I'm working with from that athlete's context from other people who are around the athlete the coach parents whoever it is and then where does that information fit into this framework and how do I use this information to help me support the athlete from there you all dive into, and we had just actually the podcast that comes out before this one, uh, we talk about this kind of optimal loading, the Goldilocks approach. Can you discuss what is optimal loading or this Goldilocks approach within this decision-making process and return to sport process? There was a lot of talk when when our group was working on this this project and it feels like yesterday but really it's sort of seven eight years ago now which just seems amazing the there was a lot of discussion at that time around acute chronic workload ratio and I think people who have been working as clinicians, as practitioners for a while will feel like, yeah, but I've always talked about load. I've always monitored load. I've always, this has always been part of my practice. And it seemed like it sort of came to prominence in, in the literature. So at, at around that time in 2016, 2015, 2016. So it was acknowledging that there was a lot more being written and talked about in conferences at that time about, about training load and trying to bring those concepts that I think people who are working day to day in the team environment have always done. You've always managed, you've always monitored workload in a training, in a non-injury scenario. You've always monitored that in a team environment. It was about bringing some of those principles to prominence when we are working with athletes who have an injury. And as I say, I think many people were already doing this, but it was, it was not as 
prominent a discussion in the literature. So we were trying to emphasize that, hey, when, when we are working with athletes who have an injury, the principles of training load monitoring are essentially the same. And it, you can't just flip a switch one day and go from, okay, your injury is healed, go back out and do your repeated sprints and you're going to be fine without having prepared for it. So bringing the training load principles into how we think and plan for returning to sport was important because it got people thinking about, well, how do I monitor load? How do I measure load in rehab? What are the sorts of ways that it is meaningful to measure load? Acute load, chronic load, whatever it is, what information do I need to take from before the athlete had the injury? How am I going to work towards getting the athlete's um, consistent load back to that level? Is that sufficient? So there's a whole bunch of questions that come up as you're managing that that continuum, that return to sport continuum. And the Goldilocks approach is thinking about it, it's not too hot, it's not too cold for Goldilocks, her porridge. In this scenario, it's it's getting the load just right, not overloading the tissues to the extent that you end up driving more injury, but not underloading so that the athlete's returning under under prepared for the demands of the sport. So I was very much taking taking the existing conversations, the existing training load and monitoring principles that people were really familiar with in the normal day-to-day sport non-injury scenario and bringing them to prominence in the injury, in the in the rehabilitation, in the sports injury Got it. context. Section three, what evidence do we have to inform the clinician's contribution to the shared return to sport decision? So y'all discuss this assessing the readiness to return to sport and you touch on open versus closed skills. Maybe we start there. Uh, What are closed skills? What are open skills? And then what does that look like if we only train or test one of those types of skills? The way that I think about open versus closed is that open is more is trying to replicate the demands of the sport. So whether that's open in the sense of the environment or open in the sense of you've got an opponent to deal with, you've got to make additional um, decisions, you've got to cope with unexpected things happening in your environment. Closed is as much control as possible. So very controlled and very uncontrolled on the two extremes. And when you're trying to make return to, when you're trying to inform return to sport decisions, you trying to figure out, well, how am I going to test that? How do I know? It's really answering the question of how do I know whether the athlete is ready to cope with those very uncontrolled demands of the sporting environment where there's opponents, where there's, you know, different different turf, there's different environmental conditions, there's a whole bunch of things going on that, that athletes have to deal with in the sporting environment. How do I start to replicate as best I can in a clinical or in a practical environment? How do I replicate some of the the things that the athlete's going to encounter when she goes back onto the pitch or the court or or wherever the the sport environment is. So that's the idea of open versus closed. And there are some of the example I like to use of a closed test is something like a hop test for, I'm sorry, I have to go back to ACL all the time, but a hop test is a good example. You can control the environment. You can keep it very stable. You can control the surface and it's, it's very closed. It's very controlled versus um, a, a test where it's an agility test where you have an athlete running towards you and you indicate with a left or a right hand, which direction the athlete should take, should change to with how, how the athlete should cut or pivot. So that's an example of moving towards something that's more open where it's less it, it, it's less controlled there's more demands on the athlete from a cognitive there are more cognitive demands on the athlete so that idea of going from very controlled to very chaotic trying to replicate what's going on in the sport environment is what we're trying to get out there with with encouraging people to consider what types of tests they're doing to figure out when the athlete is ready to go back to unrestricted sport participation. And that's the point here. It's about, it's not about saying that you can't go back to the team training environment or you can't go back to doing something that looks like your sport. This is very much at that stage where we say, okay, we're ready to discharge you completely from from rehab. You're ready, your body's ready, you're physically, you're mentally ready to go back to those unrestricted 
participation environments in whatever your sport is. And that's where we talk about not only testing physical capacity, but also psychological readiness or, or mental capacity to go back to sport. And we know all of the clinicians and practitioners who are watching and listening today will recognize that for, for athletes, psychological readiness is important. Athletes tell us that it's important. It's become much more written about in the literature and much more studied, I think, which is helpful because it's, again, it's this, this idea of the research catching up with what you already know from good experience in clinical practice. And but the challenge with psychological readiness and testing psychological readiness is how to do it. It's it's more difficult, I think, and we we don't have as much guide and we don't have as many tools to to deploy to test psychological readiness as what we do for testing whether someone's physically ready to go back. I think it's it's more in keeping with our training as sports medicine. I'm a I'm a physio, so in train in keeping with my training as a physio, I probably feel more comfortable, or not probably, I definitely feel more comfortable testing someone's hamstring strength than I do making a judgment about psychologically you're ready to go back to sport that you know the the level of anxiety you're feeling about playing sport is is normal that's okay that doesn't mean that you're not ready so so I think that's the big challenge actually with testing and return to sport testing is the types of tools that we have available how we interpret that information how we combine all of that information is a challenge and it kind of comes back again to that idea of shared decision making trying to look at the return to sport scenario from many all of the different angles and gather all of the, the information that we need from all of those different angles is a big challenge and our return to sport testing is is helping hopefully give us a lot of information to guide that shared decision making process after that section you all go into specific regions of the body and different tissues outlining some considerations and some average timelines and the prevalence so we don't have to go into all of them, but maybe because you love ACL, maybe we start there and maybe just utilize that as uh, an initial mm, specific example. So, and this was the first one you all talked about in the paper, but do you want to discuss some of the considerations and in the injury surrounding ACL injuries, the prevalence, um, the kind of the rate and the time of return to sport for ACL particularly? Yes, I'm glad that you've given me ACL as the exam question here and not shoulder dislocation or hip or hamstring. Thank you. <laughs> I'm much more familiar with ACL. So what we know from the literature, when, when we put all of the studies together in a big systematic review meta-analysis, what comes out is that when we talk about return to the pre-injury level of sport, so the, the level, the sport that the athletes were doing before they got their ACL injury, about two in every three athletes get back to that same level after their, their ACL injury. About so that means one in three do not. That doesn't mean that one in three just stop playing sport altogether. Most of the time they'll change sports, they go off and do something else. Usually for reasons that are not related to their knee. It might, it's often things like I've changed schools or I've moved away or my, my team is no longer around or the coach changed or I got sick of that sport. I wanted to change. I didn't want to get injured again. There's a whole bunch of reasons why people choose not to go back to their sport. So that's a really important thing to think about. And that number two and three get back to their pre injury sport after an ACL injury is a good number to keep in mind, especially when athletes because athletes ask you these questions. So when they ask you the question, well, how, you know, am I going to get back to my sport? You can, you can have some concrete numbers to share with athletes. It's a little bit different when we talk about elite and professional athletes, as will surprise no one, the numbers are higher. So it's about four in every five elite or professional athletes with an ACL injury get back to their previous competition. It depends a bit on the sport and it depends, again, on the environment. The best numbers that we have from men's professional football, soccer in Europe, is that it's about 97% of the players get back to their pre-injury level of competition. But 
it's usually only for about a, a three-year window. So their, their careers end up changing quite soon after that ACL injury. So they get back, but they don't have particularly long in their career after getting back to sport. We can talk about all of the reasons that might underlie that, but, but that, those are the numbers. And when we talk about competitive sport in a non-elite, non-professional environment, it's only about one in two athletes so active people, athletes, who get back to their previous competition after an ACL injury. So the numbers look very different when you're talking about elite athletes versus non-elite athletes, which is not a surprise because when you're a non-elite athlete, you have a day job, you don't have all of the uh, medical and performance support that that many athletes will have in there, at least if they're a professional athlete. Some elite athletes will have that, others will not. So it's very dependent, I think, on the support that you have around you to get over that injury and also the incentives. So if you're a professional athlete, there's a pretty big incentive to get back to your sport because that's how you earn a living. So there's a lot of factors as you can hear, there's a lot of factors that, that play into this decision to go back to sport. And, and for, for athletes, for many different athletes, it's going to look very, re return to sport is going to look very different. So those are the numbers for returning to sport. It looks like men return to sport in, return to their pre-injury sport in greater numbers than women. But it doesn't make a difference when you look at returning to any kind of sport. So what I take away from that is that women or female athletes have made a different decision about their career or about their participation in sport. They might, they've often they've changed sports. So they might have gone from playing soccer to running or going to the gym or swimming or something like that that's less risky, I think. For their knee, I think that's why a lot of these athletes, and this is this is my opinion, not this is this is not the research evidence. My my opinion is that athletes are making a judgment that it's risky for me to go back to a cutting and pivoting sport, and I'm just not prepared to go through that again. It's it's not a good stage of life. I've got other commitments. I've got other priorities in my life. I want to keep playing sport. I want to keep staying. I want to keep being active. But my cutting and pivoting sport that I played before is, is not the, the thing that I need to go back to. For, for other athletes, it very much is. So it's really individual. And that's why, again, it's a, you've got to have these conversations with the athlete in front of you. You can't assume that athletes, all athletes are going to want to get back to their handball or their soccer or their whatever their previous cutting and pivoting sport is. But don't assume that they don't want to either. And the other thing that's interesting with ACL injuries is that Usually, when athletes first get an injury, they will say to you, they'll be adamant that, yep, I'm absolutely going to get back to my previous sport. I'm going to get back to soccer. I'm going to get back to football. I'm going to get back to whatever it was. And then their priorities change as they progress through their recovery and rehabilitation. It's really not unusual for people's priorities and values and preferences to change as they progress through rehab and, and they have more time to think about it. So there's a whole bunch of things going on with returning to sport and the reasons why people make make different decisions about their return to sport goals and then ultimately what happens once they do make that transition back to sport. And then the other part of it is once people get back to their sport, there's the concern about staying healthy, about avoiding another injury. The data suggests that the younger people are and the more like, and the, and the, so younger and going back to pivoting sports are the, the things that are, are most risky, which is not surprising because young athletes are just more likely to go back to their pivoting sports. So I think we've got to get some more research out. We've got to do some better study actually to really understand if we account for the fact that more young, more athletes who are younger go back to their sport generally compared to older athletes. And we try to account for the different types of sport demands that people are going back to. What does that what, what implications does that have for re-injury risk? We, we really, there's a big missing piece in that actually and trying to better understand what's going on when people are getting back to or after they get back to their sport, what's going on with re-injury risk is a really important piece of research that needs to happen. And I know people are working in this space. I think we can do more to help clinicians and athletes and practitioners make informed decisions.
So it, it's complicated, is the, or it's complex, I should say, is the, the sort of short answer to all of this with ACL injuries. And I guess the other point that I'll make when we, when we're talking about return to sport and re-injury is trying to encourage people to think not only about the ACL, re-injury but also thinking about the other knee structures it's quite common for people to get meniscus tears or other types of in intra-articular injuries that actually have a much bigger implication for their long-term knee health we're getting really strong evidence that it's not the acl the isolated the isolated acl injury that's the the death knell for osteoarthritis it's it's the extent of the articular surface injury or the menis particularly the meniscus injury that's the strong predictor for developing post-traumatic osteoarthritis and there's a lot of work going on in this space to try to figure out what are the best rehabilitation approaches what are the best injury prevention approaches and I'll give a shout out to the OptiNe group of and I have to do, I have to declare I'm a member of the OptiNe I'm a, I have the privilege of being a member of the OptiNe group and, and that group of more than 30 clinician scientists are doing a, a ton of work in this space trying to figure out how do we best support Support athletes with knee injuries to stay healthy throughout the lifespan. So not only focused on the early stages of knee health, but knee health right through the lifespan, particularly this big burden of post-traumatic osteoarthritis. So there's a lot of work going on in that space and a lot of people trying to understand how, how can we best support athletes. The other, I think, I guess the other number, and you mentioned it, Chris, a bit earlier when you gave the example of the young athlete with an ACL injury. The other number that will stick in people's minds is the nine month number for time before returning to sport. And I think that's a, a really good rule of thumb or a really good heuristic for people to, to push for. And, and the evidence, the research in this field supports really supports this idea of nine months or even 12 months, better still 12 months as a, as a good rule of thumb for the time it takes to recover and get back to sports safely. And Dr. Heger Grindham, Professor Lynn snyder mackler and others who have led, Professor Mayana Risberg, who have led the Oslo, Delaware cohort that's been just this incredible wealth of information and wealth of knowledge for us as clinicians. Has, they have really made a big difference in how we think about the transition between re the rehab program and then going back to unrestricted sport participation and the timeframes around that. And you're right that the criteria, return to sport criteria are critical, but it seems like there's also a bit of a critical amount of time that athletes' bodies need simply to recover the physical capacities to cope with the demands of their sport. And that's where that nine to 12 month mark comes in. Could you briefly, uh, if you have the stats on you and it's okay if you don't, but if they're, if it's a youth athlete coming in and it's their second tear either on that same limb or on the contralateral limb, what is that, how does that discussion look different from a timelines perspective and from a risk of a third tear and just, uh, you know, probabilities of return back to either same level or higher than level sport? I don't think we have good numbers, actually. I think this is one of the challenges. If if we're trying to use that research, if we think of evidence-based practice as kind of three, people like to think of it as a three-legged stool. I like to think of it as a sort of three interlocking circles. So if we take that research circle, it's we, we actually don't have very good numbers and very strong evidence or really much evidence at all to help us make that decision. So it very much is based on your clinical experience, the clinical testing, the values and preferences of the athlete in this scenario. I think what we what we do know is that from the numbers vary, but it's somewhere around 20% risk of of re-injury, of new ACL injury if you are returning to a pivoting sport. So, and different people are going to interpret that number in very different ways. And I think we learned, we've learned through the COVID pandemic that 
we as society find it very difficult to interpret risk and to to know what what that number actually means for me as an individual so that's where i would encourage people to to know what the numbers are read as read the literature make sure that you're as up to date as you can be with the literature and be prepared to share that information and then have a chat with the athlete about well what does 20 percent mean in the context of a whole team what does 20 percent mean to me is 20 percent really high for me or is it or am i not worried about that it's gonna it comes back to that start framework what's the what's the context and how much tolerance do i as an individual have for risk am i you know trying to support this very young athlete am i concerned about this very young athlete having a long life a long healthy life that doesn't that's not affected by post-traumatic osteoarthritis um, or is it a different scenario so it, i i'm sorry that i can't give a more concrete i i like to give concrete examples Examples. I like to give concrete numbers uh, and I'm, I'm not deliberately sort of obfuscating and trying not to answer your question. I think it's this is what's really challenging for us as clinicians and practitioners when we're supporting athletes, that the, the numbers are going to look different and, and people are going to interpret these numbers very differently depending on their experience and their own context. And, and that's where we do have to get comfortable at, at knowing what the numbers are and then helping athletes navigate and understand what those numbers mean, mean for them as an individual. That all makes sense. Last section, section four, re return to sport research, the priorities and future directions. So this is kind of wrapping up the paper and moving forward. And I would say reflections, it's been, like you said, seven to eight years since this was published and you all had this meeting. What were those priorities now? And some of, have those things, some of those things been met over the past seven to eight years? I think we have got to a much better place at how we as a community talk and the common language that we use when we talk about return to sport, when we're talking with athletes, when we're talking with each other particularly. And I am really heartened at conferences to hear people now consistently talking about return to sport continuum or talking about return to performance or you know, adopting some of the language that we encouraged people to use in this consensus, because one of the biggest challenges when we, when we got into this area in the first place was working was trying to work through what is it that different people mean when they write about return to sport and as a clinician practitioner community that's also challenging for to make sure that we are all on the same page when we're having these conversations among ourselves so that's that's one good good thing and I think we have moved very much away from that gatekeeper mentality of return to sport is a yes, no decision that the, the clinician, often the medical doctor makes for the athlete or on behalf of the athlete. It's very much now moving towards, if not at that shared decision-making approach where we're supporting athletes. We're taking that step back and saying, what can I as a clinician, as a member of this team do to support these athletes? So, so we've got to that good place, I think. Um, where I think we're still struggling is in understanding the numbers. We just had a long discussion about the numbers and what does the evidence tell us for different sports and different injuries. One of the challenges is that there are so many different sports and so many different injuries. And I would encourage people, I want to recommend a paper that we published in JOSPT at the beginning of 2022. And it's a consensus statement from Bern. It was the same Sport Physio Swiss group con uh, commissioning work on consensus around managing sports injury uh, shoulder injuries in sport again athletes of all ages looking at injury prevention rehab return to sport and there what we tried to do was capture the very different ways that athletes use their shoulders in sport and thinking about overhead athletes versus rowers versus climbers versus martial artists the way that these athletes are using their shoulders the types of injuries that they're getting in their sport look very different so i think that's one of our big challenges is knowing and it, it's really where we as individual practitioners clinicians have to probably take the responsibility in our own sports of figuring out what is it the what is it uh, that are the injuries that I'm most likely to see what do I typically see so what's going to make sense for me to to know about if I'm working in a field in a running field sport I've, I've got to know about hamstring injuries I've got to know about ankle sprains um, if I'm working in, in 
in tennis, I need to know about shoulder injuries. So figuring out what is it that are the typical injuries that you see and then working from there through um, trying to understand the return to sport progressions that these athletes are typically seeing because you're not going to get all of that information from the literature. That's one of the, I think that's one of the big challenges. It's, it's partly because there are so many injuries, so many different sports, as we said, and trying to capture all of that information is, is a challenge. So knowing, really knowing your sport Sport and knowing your athletes is going to give you a lot of important information to bring to bear in that return to sport decision making shared or shared decision making um, discussion. What was the hardest part of this meeting, if you can remember, or whether it was like deciding on one specific, um, was there more disagreement on one specific area? What generally with these meetings, because you've been a, a part of multiple consensus statement, tends to be the hardest part of this process? Um, I think the hardest part of it is actually getting the paper written <laughs> because, because everybody goes back to their day jobs. Everybody comes together, has the discussion, talks about the stuff, and then everybody goes back to their day jobs and we're trying to fit in writing up the, the paper in a timely manner. So it's, it's sort of a very boring academic thing to say. But often I think that people, when they're coming into these meetings, people are bringing different perspectives, of course, and that's the beauty of a good consensus meeting. And I want to give a shout out to my colleague and friend here in Vancouver, Paul Blazy, who Paul is a physio, sports physio, running particularly, and he's doing a lot of very important work. He's just finished his, finished his master's degree in consensus within sports medicine and trying to make consensus better, moving it from where we were in 2015, which was really a group of like-minded people often you know you get your mates together and you go to a conference and you have a discussion and you write up what you talked about to where we are now with consensus which is about thinking through and and a good example of this is the oxford consensus on femoral acetabular or on primary cam morphology that my friend and colleague again dr paul dykstra led that is kind of the gold standard the benchmark for consensus statements in our field i would argue right now that was a very long process of delphi of gathering representatives of the community together from radiologists physios orthopedic surgeons people with lived experience of of FAI, femoral acetabular impingement syndrome, lived experience of hip pain, um, researchers, everybody with a 360 degree view of this issue and trying to figure out what are the different perspectives of people in a very rigorous and robust way using that Delphi process, gathering people together in a two-day meeting to work out with a very structured, because there is a very structured research-based way of figuring out priorities setting those priorities and then writing them and disseminating that information to the, the whole community through, yes, academic articles, but podcasts, infographics, editorials, blogs. There's a whole bunch of different ways now that we, we are using to reach the people who are important end users of this, of this work, whether that's clinicians, practitioners, patients, policymakers, caregivers, carers, etc. So I think actually getting the people in the room is not the issue. People, we all want to contribute. We all want to we all want to do a good job for the athletes that we work with. And there's, by definition, different perspectives and views. And that's what makes this such an important process. Because if we just gathered the views of, of physios, that's going to look very different to the views potentially of orthopedic surgeons or the views of radiologists or the views of researchers. And and then we're missing the most important people in this, the patients, the athletes, the people with the lived experience. So bringing that group, bringing those people to the table as equals is so, so important. So I think the biggest challenge is, is not in getting the people together and managing that discussion and that idea and synthesizing information process. It's actually making sense of that and then sharing that information with the world. And then helping people to take that next step of implementing that work into their practice. I think those are the bigger challenges actually that rather than, than getting the people together to have the discussions. That all makes sense. And it seems I'm only 26 and I'm not even a year into being a clinician, but it seems like there's been a big shift of the outlets of 
presenting information in a variety of forms, whether it's from uh, an actual white paper and uh, primary research article, all the way down to like an Instagram infographic. And how do you, how do all those along that spectrum still present high quality information with the inherent limitations of less information and more of a quick piece? How is this still applicable and not to water down or, you know, et cetera. So I'm sure it's a tough problem, but it's also very helpful for having just more individuals see the information. Exactly. And it's recognizing that a lot of people can't even access journal articles. And I say this as a journal editor, I'm really aware of that. So there are lots of different ways that we as a research and clinician and patient community can work together. And there are people who are doing really good work in this space. And, and I think the, the best example for me that I've been involved in is the, the HIP, the um, primary CAM morphology consensus process. And that was a very structured plan, actually. So thinking through, it's like, I guess, any kind of communication strategy when the government wants to make a, a policy change they think about a communication strategy when a brand is is creating a new product they think of a communication strategy that's what this group did was thinking about what what's the strategy how do we get this information out to the people who need to see it and will want to see it and need to use it where are the places that these people are going to to get their information is it a journal article for whom is a journal article most appropriate versus who's accessing information via podcast, who is getting information from social media. And I think there is a really important place for trusted sources. And that's where, where academic journals can come in, where the academic journal has the trust of and the rigor of the research that's that's gone on and then so so taking that trusted source and thinking about how can that trusted source disseminate information through different channels that might not it's not simply the research article but that's why as a journal we have an instagram channel for example that's why we use that's why we, we're on all of these social media platforms because we recognize that people get their information from different places and ultimately i think what we're all trying to do is find trusted sources of information as you say chris it's hard to know often when you see something how do I trust this information? And particularly for people who are perhaps not used to reading journal articles. And I'm thinking of the athletes and patients that I've worked with who, who really want this information. They want to be engaged in this process. They want to contribute. They don't necessarily have access to the university library to read the journal article, but they, they want to know that what they're seeing on social media or that they're reading on a blog post is accurate and that they can trust it. And that's where I think the journal has a really important role and we do have to think about as a journal and as an academic community how do we disseminate that trustworthy information through the channels that people are, are accessing are using to access information sam do you have any other final thoughts or questions i think this is a good spot to wrap up if not no i think that was really good i think the consensus statement is a great outline of the overarching research and framework that clinicians can apply to basically any situation and help to yeah, work collectively in that shared decision process. So it's a great resource for people and it's open access, which is nice. Boom. Thank you so much, Claire, for coming on. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. It's really, it's really fun to get to chat with you and to share how this has evolved and how it's changed over the last seven, eight years since we, we started this work. And I, I really, it is such a joy to see people taking this work and running with it, doing different research projects, building it into their clinical practice, speaking about it at conferences with how that, how this information has helped them develop their thinking around return to sport and, and working with athletes to, to support athletes. Because ultimately this, that's why we're all here, right? We, we care about athletes and we want to, we want to support athletes to achieve whatever it is that they've set themselves to achieve so thanks thanks for this opportunity and thanks to to you actually and and also thanks to you for the podcast but we've just talked about different ways of reaching people with trusted information and your podcast is very much one of those sources so thanks for the service that you do for the community it's it's so important and awesome. i really thanks Claire. It.